I don't try to make it complicated. In fact, I try to make it so simple. My goal is not to become famous. My goal is not to sound complicated. My goal is not to confuse you. My goal is to explain to you what I've learned in such an easy way that you will actually understand it with your guts, even if you don't have scientific brain. So I divide all this information that I have to share in very simple pieces. And I would like to start with a very basic question is, what is life? Are you alive? Yes. How do you know that you're alive? You say, because you're moving, but there are mechanical toys that are moving. So why do you know that you're alive? Can you think, forget about the books you read, just think for yourself and tell me, why do you think you're alive? Because I can breathe. Because you can breathe? Well, the, the vacuum cleaner is breathing too. <laughs> love, you feel love, that's very, very nice. I have intuition. You have intuition? A smile every day. There are smiling toys there. <laughs> uh, so why do we know we lie? We're alive, and where is life in your body? When you show that you lie, where is exactly life in your body? Is it just in your nose or in your head or in your fingers or in the parts that are moving? Can you ask yourself, every single person, where is life in your body? Everywhere, where everywhere. Well, did you read about this in a scientific book, or this is what how you feel? What is that that's pouring from our eyes, which they say it's the windows of soul? Why is that sometimes it is uncomfortable to look in somebody's eyes? And you can take a doll and look in doll's eyes for hours, you wouldn't feel no discomfort. <laughs> but when you're looking in people's eyes, you definitely experience something, and sometimes it could be very, very dramatic. And you met a friend who you didn't see for a long time, actually you didn't want to see that friend, and you glanced at him and you just turned away because you didn't want him to know to notice that you glanced at him. But then he knows that, you know that he saw you right away. How do you know? And you can stand on the other side of the football field, and I look in your pupils and you look in mine, the pupils are as small as letters in the book. If I place the book on the other side of the football field, can you read the book? No. no. How do you know exactly that I'm looking right at you there? How do you know that I'm looking right at you? That's life in us. So what do you think? Is life important? Yes. yes. Whatever has life in it is called living things, living matter. Whatever doesn't have life in it still has some vibration, but we call it non-living matter. Uh, I don't want to use the word dead matter, but not life. Uh, we've made out of life, and so we need life for us to, to keep being alive. And every single cell out of 35 trillion cells in our body has life in it. Actually, in Toronto at the Total Health, I took um, a picture of my entire body by using advanced Kirlian photography, and I figured out that my energy is actually bigger than me. It's just like this. And so this is all life in me. So every cell in our body has life in it. Now, in the soil, we have pieces of rocks and pieces of uh, matter that is not alive. And then there is a layer of uh, soil, and then there are plants, there are beautiful plants that uh, um, have roots, and the roots reach for those pieces like calcium and uh, nitrogen and silicon and iron. So they, they grab those pieces of minerals, and then they pull them, they... They soak them, soak, suck them inside, and now, as soon as it goes above the surface, then the sunshine uh, touches it with its rays, and what scientists call uh, photosynthesis happens. Well, I think it's a miracle of uh, life happens when sun touches these minerals in these um, plants. The, this mineral instantly becomes alive. The birth happens. It's like uh, ejaculation, you know, just like uh, mm, this, this mineral that used to be dead and useless becomes 
alive. If you would be able to eat those minerals, that would be wonderful. But you cannot eat them. When you have osteoporosis, doctor cannot tell you, hey, go you know, get some marble in the mountains and uh, crush it in your Vitamix blender and just begin eating it, and you'll have lots of calcium. No, you'll just have kidney stones, nothing else. So, but the kingdom of plants can do this for us. They transfer that into something we, our body could recognize. Now, in this plant, we have the same minerals, calcium and iron and silicon and you name it, magnesium. But then these ones have life in them and our body could recognize them. When they get inside of our body, here you have a bone from your body. <laughs> <laughs> which has lots of calcium, but somewhere there is no calcium. And so this bone needs desperately some calcium. And then when you're eating that plant, that calcium, when it gets with the flow of your blood to your body, your body can talk to it the same language. Think for a moment what has to happen in your body so that piece of plant has to become part of your bone. First of all, how will this calcium know where to go? Like you came to this church, there was a sign, you have to go into this room. How does this know? It doesn't have no brain. It doesn't have, we think, no intellect. How does this piece of calcium know to become part of your bone? Because it speaks the same language. Because they have the same vibration that they recognize. It's like living creatures. It's like little humans, like little people. It's amazing. So whenever you need calcium somewhere and you eat high quality calcium there and it's live calcium, you rest assured that calcium will come directly when it's necessary most. Isn't that a miracle? That's a miracle. Now imagine that this napkin has lots of calcium in it because it's made from the wood. It, it does. Only it's not live calcium. Do you think that if I'll put this napkin in there, in this hole in the bone, it could take a space of the calcium? Will it be able to talk the same language? No. When you, res you open the door and your, neighbor, your neighbors, your family, people who you know come to you, you say, oh, hi, come on in, right? And then suddenly there will be a stranger who doesn't speak your language who is dressed differently than you, you don't recognize him, who are you? Will you let him in? Answer, will you let him in? You say, oh, come on in, be my guest. No. Somebody who looks very strange and very different, you will say, hey, a cold place, get out of here. Mm -hmm. That's what your body does when you get in some um, non, non -live, no, not alive matter. So your body treats it as toxins. <laughs> And now what do we beautiful humans so smart do? We grow precious organic, organic fruits and vegetables and then we take them and put them in a the pot and boil and kill this life in them and then we put it in our body and we believe that it's going to work just the same. Do you comprehend what I'm saying? Yes. Does it make sense? I think it's pretty simple <laughs> that it's not the same. God, nature, universe created this order that things are there and there are so many of them and then there are lots of plants covering the whole um, land except asphalt where we placed it. Right? <laughs> and then these plants are working for us. We don't have to pay for that. It's free. They just grab in those pieces of minerals and then they expose it to the sun and then they turn them into alive elements that are vibrating with the same frequency which is actually 12 megahertz per minute or per, per second just like our body. And so then we consume those fresh, crispy whatever, fruits, vegetables, nuts and seeds, and our body has everything it needs, abundance. And then we die, we go back in the soil, and then there are more elements, and it's just like a circle of life. Okay? But we have created now different things. So this is just some basics about why raw food is so good, why it works, why it's better. It's something just to understand, because when I read the first book about enzymes, I had to use vocabulary like every five minutes. It was so complicated. Okay. <clears throat> now, the law of vital adjustment is very important. 
every, every living thing is constantly adjusting to the environment. Every living thing is changing every moment according to the environment. That's why the frog has the color of the pond. That's the, why the snake has the color of what? Desert. And the hair, uh, uh, the rabbits in, in, in Canada change their fur twice a year. They're so fashionable. <laughs> They go to such extent they shed twice a year to change the color of the fur, which is, takes lots of effort. Why they do that? Why do they do that? Camouflage. For what reason? Camouflage. For what reason? Camouflage. To survive. To survive. So the living thing's body is dedicated for you to survive. Your body is dedicated and it's changing constantly. If you're telling me that you're alive, then it means your body is changing constantly. Dr. Claude Bernard in France, in the last, beginning of last century, he made this experiment. He took the glass bell and he placed a live bird under this bell. And the bird survived for four hours and then the bird died from lack of oxygen. Okay? He took another bird, four hours, and birds died from lack of oxygen. And then, listen attentively, he changed this experiment. He took fresh bird just exactly the same and after one hour after one hour without changing the content of oxygen he exchanged those birds he replaced this bird with the fresh one if you were listening attentively how many hours this bird had to leave there everybody answer please did you understand do you want me to repeat okay this one would stay for but after one hour he replaced it with a fresh bird how long did this bird have to live? This bird dropped dead. He said, wow, it dropped dead. Can you think for a moment and make a discovery why this bird dropped dead? Because this bird was not adjusted for the lack of oxygen. That is why if somebody is drinking two cups of vodka every day, back in Russia they do it like normally, then and they say, well, look at us. We're so strong yeah, Russian men. When Americans come, they just drink two shots and they're just under the table. Look, they're, so wi they're wimps. Is it true? No, their body's adjusted to drinking vodka. What does it mean adjusted? Adjusted means with the l less, uh, with the less um, toxins, with the less um, negative effect. Adjusted. That's why smokers... They adjusted to smoking. They could smoke two, three packs of cigarettes a day when uh, the first cigarette is the most toxic in their life. Did you know that? And sometimes the second smoke is more toxic to those people around and to the smoker because their body is completely covered with the mucus inside the lungs and their uh, blood, um, the heartbeat goes uh, twice as, as fast so the blood it comes to the heart. So. Their bodies adjusted so they could stay, still uh, live as long as it possible. They, the body changes. That's why those who drink coffee, their bodies adjusted to coffee. And uh, we don't know everything what body does to adjust. We only know that when body, when you drink coffee every morning, your body creates. Let us call it anti-caffeine, some a substance that lowers your blood pressure the substance that neutralizes the caffeine, anti-caffeine. And one day you decided you're going to quit, or maybe you just ran out of coffee, or maybe you didn't have time and you didn't drink coffee. You know what happens? Your blood pressure becomes so low you have headache. How many of you practiced and had this once in your life? Okay, you know that you'll have headache. And the only thing that's going to help is a little bit of caffeine, either black tea or coffee. Sooner or later, you have it. But then if you continue not to drink coffee, three days, four days, then your body does what? Yes. Adjust to not drinking coffee. And then how many of you quit drinking coffee? Just fine. Yeah, just three, four days and no headache. Right? So your body is constantly adjusting. Now, how does the body adjust to cooked food? The body has to adjust to cooked food. At what age? Somewhere at six months old, the body has to adjust. 
We don't know everything that body does, but I know two things. First of all, body creates the muco mucoid plug, which is a mucus lining, which is, um, goes uh, along the entire digestive tract, which is five, 55 feet long, 55 feet long. It's, a, it's like a rubbery hose, it's a black color that, uh, that covers, or maybe dark green color, covers the entire digestive tract. There is a rise and shine cleanse created by Dr. Richard Anderson. When people take this cleanse for a month, they pass 55 feet long rubbery hose. How many of you heard of that? Yeah, maybe even did it. <laughs> Well, the good news is when you go on raw food, it dissolves and you don't even have to do the cleanse. Isn't it good? <laughs> well, don't think that you need to get rid of that because it's yucky stuff and you don't want it there. Because it is what? It is your protection from absorption of toxins from cooked food. Your body is really doing great thing to protect you from cooked food. I couldn't understand in the beginning when I went on raw food, and we've uh, ten, almost 10 years ago, January 21st, and then on my birthday, July 25, we decided to celebrate being six months 100% raw, being a good girl and good boy, me and my husband went to Red Lobster <laughs> to celebrate. And I told in the beginning, it was just everything was good and uh, food was so good. I said, Igor, it's gonna be my best birthday ever. <laughs> But before long, we started to feel so sick, and I felt cramps in my jaw, and my just all my in, in, inside was hurting, and he was hurting too. And next morning, we were just ooh, out of shape. And I was thinking, why in the world I feel so bad? I'm supposed to become younger from raw food. Six months ago, I was, I was able to eat the whole pizza by myself, and I didn't hurt that much, and now raw food made me hurt. I thought, well, Raw food is not really as good. <laughs> now I understand is because my body readjusted. Then I started to think, well, if cooked food is so bad, why not everybody else is dying from eating that red lobster every day? They're supposed to be put into my calculation dead long time ago. And I see my neighbor barbecuing every evening and drinking a case of beer and he has pink chicks and have sometimes have good mood and <laughs> I was asking those questions and I didn't comprehend what's going on now I understand his body adjusted well of course uh, at the age of 40 we begin to fall apart unless you really do something in your life different we begin to need glasses our hair suddenly we need to dye hair and then uh, we just get, begin to get old, all kinds of pills, all kinds of doctors, antidepressants, uh, glasses and whatever, vitamins. Uh, but um, other than that, uh, the body is dedicated and devoted for your well-being. Ten years ago, I was very unhappy with my body. I was talking to myself, I was thinking, why do I feel so, why did I get, why, why am I so unlucky, why did I get such a poor body? Did you see my picture 10 years ago? How many of you seen that? Yeah, you have to look at that, then you realize that I'm really cute. <laughs> <laughs> today, today, because then, well, it's in this, in this book, I'm afraid to come closer to that, because it's going to squeak. The Rough Family Book, there is my picture, it's one of my best pictures because the bad pictures I destroyed on the spot. <laughs> and even so, 200, 120 pounds bigger than now and really, really ugly. And I was, <laughs> I was thinking, why did I get such an ugly, smelly body? And that um, any time I eat a little bit, I'll gain weight. All my girlfriends eat pizzas and cakes and they don't gain weight and I gain right away and I have pimples and headaches and all kinds of pain in my body and dysfunctions and depression. And then something happened. I didn't go to the store. I didn't go to Big Carrot and didn't buy myself a new body. This is the same body. Do you understand that this is the same body? But I like it so much now. I love it. 
I love this body. It has so much energy and it always is working for me. It's always doing such a good job for me. You cannot imagine how much I work these days. My friends think it's insane. Average, I drive 300 miles a day and every single day I teach a big class. And then I have family, I publish books, and sometimes I sleep for four or five day, uh, hours per night, weeks and weeks. I cannot imagine. I never get sick. I don't have health insurance. I don't have any gray hair. My eyes are 20 over 10. It's the same body. So who changed? What changed? My behavior changed. My behavior. So that means that even 20 years ago, my body was eager to change. Do you understand that? That my body was eager, even 30 years ago, it was so eager to be healthy and cute. <laughs> but who was on the way? What was on the way? My behavior. My body could not overcome the behavior that I performed. That means that your body is really devoted to you being very healthy and very beautiful and very happy. It's dedicated. Do you believe me? Who is on the way? What is on the way? You and your behavior. When you were born, you were all so, so cute babies. Remember your albums? Have you seen them? You were just so precious. And then you behaved certain way, you did certain things, and you started to become less cute and less cute and less cute. Do you think that you can continue to do what you're doing and add some supplements and pills and tablets on top of it and experience difference, the change? Tell me. No. no, you have to change your behavior. But you need to know how to change it. And I strongly believe that we need to change it towards natural because there is an order in nature. And I see that the closer I go there, the better my body serves me. Unfortunately, we have been um, conditioned in a certain way. This program, scientifically based, has been placed in our head. And it's so hard for us to get away from that program. It's just sitting there and we're like hypnotized. Whatever doesn't sound like that program, we reject. So let us try today, uh, forget about that program and be very radical. <laughs> let us be our radical day <laughs> and think for ourselves and see clearly. Clearly means have your own opinion, your own point of view what's going on and maybe we'll discover a totally different thing and it will be now so easy for you to know what to do to feel better. Do you want to feel better? Yes. Only half people want to feel better. <laughs> do you want to feel better? Yes. So what do you need to do? Change. change behavior and wonderful so you want to know how to change behavior let's see the law of vital adjustment works whether you know about this or not there are human laws and there are universal laws the human laws you can break and get get away with it like you can speed five miles faster and policemen wouldn't see you I don't say that you have to do but it's possible you can hide from IRS ten dollars that's possible but universal laws no matter how much you hide in your cupboards no matter how you wrap your wraps from candy and don't show anybody the universal laws they work no matter who sees you or not and they gonna hurt you if if you deserve it that's the universal laws they you cannot really escape um, so how does it work when we born we have this beautiful body and we have lungs very beautiful organ for breathing and many people think that to breathe is just to get air in lungs and that's enough is it just enough when you breathe just to get your your air in lungs in and out in and out yeah. no what's what's necessary <laughs> that uh, it's necessary that your body 
do that, that your body takes out of lungs this air and somehow get it to every one of 35 trillion cells every moment and then collect it back and brings it to lungs. Do you think it's a pretty hard job? Wow, it's, it's, and it's 24 hours a day, that's lungs, okay? Now when we're born, we have clean lungs, empty, beautiful, the color of lips inside, the light pink color, and then when we begin to eat cooked food, then it, the whole picture changes. When we begin to eat cooked food, it usually involves dairy and cooked carbohydrates, those are the most mucus forming foods. Then the body begins to create mucus in order to um, grab um, infection or dust or anything, grab it together. And so the mucus begins to accumulate in lungs. So baby is six months old. Have you seen babies who just breathe like this? <coughs> have, you heard, have you heard babies like this? If you see any babies around, put your ear to their chest and listen. They have already mucus in their bronx in the trachea, in the throat, in the lungs, and poor children, they will have to go through cleans. How does it happen? When there is a, and when there is a chance, the body will try to throw it out. What is the chance? What is the chance? Sickness. What is the chance? It's, it's when, you, when the body is very energetic, when the body has extra energy. When does it happen? On vacation! <laughs> When the baby was swimming in the ocean, was sleeping outside, eating lots of fruits, has lots of um, energy, and was walking along the beach, we blame it on the wet hair. See, I told you don't stay too long in the ocean. No, that's because there is extra energy in them. The, the body decides, hey, I think I could do it now. When sometimes you rest, you look at your house, you say, oh, I think I, I'm gonna do a cleanup. Now I have enough energy. So that's how the body does. They say. The body doesn't like that mucus in the body. It doesn't like it there in lungs. Lungs are supposed to breathe, not to have this mucus there. And so the body begins to move this mucus. And the baby has runny nose. Tell me honestly, do you appreciate that? When the body throws away, do you appreciate that? Honestly, always they say, oh, how good, it's working. Oh, my precious baby, its body is so wonderful. It's getting mucus out. No. In some countries, I've been to Bahamas, Jamaica, Costa Rica, I've seen Russian gypsy children, they always have runny nose. And their parents, I was so annoyed by them, they never pay no attention. I said, what, what barbers? They don't pay no attention to children running, having runny nose. In our civilized world, we wipe it out, we take it for, to a doctor, and the doctor prescribes nose drops. What is nose drops? Is it something so valuable that you will pour it on your salad? <laughs> something you will feed your baby with a spoon as much as you can because they baby drops, uh, nose drops deficient or what? <laughs> and what is that? And why we agree to let doctors do that to our babies? Do we really not care? Okay, what does the baby draw, the nose drops do? They distract the attention of the body. They create a havoc and the body says, hey, forget about the, the lungs, that could wait another year. Let's take care um, of taking out the nose drops out of the body because it's gonna stay there as toxin forever. So let's take it now. And so no nose drop, no running nose. And then we give flowers to the dog, say, thank you, doctor, it worked. He doesn't have runny nose. We don't understand. We have this program that that's normal, not to have runny nose. Now, the, the, in lungs, we have mucus accumulating there. <sighs> then the baby will have white, pale color of the skin because mucus will be transported to the um, layer under the skin. Now, the baby will, will kind of have it in sinuses now and in the forehead, and the baby will come become irritable. Have you seen those babies who are so kind of uh, pale and pastry, and they really kind of irritated there? They have so much mucus. One day the body will put together all efforts and create high fever. Do we celebrate when we have high fever? High fever is a good thing. The body puts a great effort in creating high fever. Do you know why body does high fever? Because that high fever 
the enzymes in the body, those are catalysts of energy, they work twice as fast. It's like you have double amount of enzymes. It's so beneficial. All the bacteria, <coughs> the bad um, pathogenic bacteria, is destroyed at high fever. Now, when body has high fever, it says, hey, don't eat, please. Eating will take so much more energy from me. And the body creates no eating condition, no appetite condition. It covers the tongue with the white coating that makes the food not tasty. Do you remember that? The nose is stuffed so you cannot smell the food. The eyelids are so heavy and so painful that you cannot see the food. Body wants you to close your eyes and rest. The tonsils are so enlarged that uh, you cannot swallow the food. Do we co cooperate with the body? Do we listen? When the body says, please don't eat anything, even an apple, here comes grandmother with the chicken soup. It's in America. In Russia, grandmother comes with the boiled milk with butter and honey in it. In Europe, they come with a hot wine or something. So in every country they have, I don't know what they come up with different countries. I think we could have a contest here and everybody will be telling what people treat their, people, their loved ones when they have high fever. They're usually very heavy, toxic stuff. So what will body reaction will be to that chicken soup? Thrown up? The body says, oh no, oh please. What if body doesn't have that spare energy to throw up? Then the complication will happen. The complications. Have you heard of complications when people have high fever? They say that happens because of high fever, the complications. Actually, complications happen because people eat when they have high fever. And they say, high fever is so dangerous. You have to put it down, otherwise you could die. No. You cannot die from high fever. You can die if you don't cooperate with your body. If you do something opposite what your body wants. Now we don't listen to the body. For example, do you remember when you had high fever? You were feeling cold, hot, cold, hot, fluctuating, cold, hot. So you'll take off your covers, you put on the covers you put. Do you remember that? Do you remember that? So your children feel the same way because the body, when it's, it wants to regulate certain level of temperature, and it lets you know. It's very friendly. It says, I'm hot, I'm hot. uncover. Now I'm cold, I'm shivering, cover back. When we have children in bed, we say, they say, Mom, I'm hot. They say, no, honey, you have to keep the covers on. Yes. We force them. And they, they develop seizures. Because they become too hot, body begins to try to get covers off. So what's wrong with the covers? They just don't come so big. Body develops seizures. My son, when he was one year old, he once had seizures when he had high, high fever. And I called ambulance and I said, oh, this is a sign of meningitis. We're going to come and give him prednisolone shot. <laughs> and I called my pediatrician. And she was a very old woman, 60 years. She was ready to go on retirement. And I was so lucky. She called me. She said, Victoria. Do you have too many uh, blankets on your son? I said, oh, yeah, I have three thick blankets. She said, instantly put him in a lukewarm shower. Put him in your lap so he doesn't get scared of cold water. So I did, and his seizures stopped. When the ambulance came, they were so angry at me. They said, let's give him shot, or let's give him shot anyways, <laughs> since we came. <laughs> So, um, what, what do we do when uh, somebody has high fever? We treat him with aspirin, salicylic acid. You know, salicylic acid is the toxic poison. Um, the witches in 15th century, they were uh, using it to, to poison people to death. The salicylic acid. And you know how bad it is for your body, your precious body that is dedicated to you, devoted? <laughs> Um, so we treat it with aspirin. This aspirin stays in your body, almost, almost impossible to get it out, stays in your body for the rest of your life, and as a result of that, you cannot develop high fever anymore. Just remember, when you were five years old or four years old, you had very high, good, good quality fever. If you were treated with aspirin, you since then you never had high fever anymore. You had low fever your body cannot go any further because it's like chains on your body's organs. Do you understand what I'm saying? Is it true that when you had high fever, you treated with aspirin, you cannot have a high fever anymore? Do you remember that? Anybody? Right? Yes. The good news is 
that if you go and grow food, the aspirin will leave your body and your body will become normal and you'll get your high fever back. Everybody in my family had high fever. It was wonderful because, you know why it was wonderful? Because when I was treated, when I had high fever when I was a child, it usually would take a week, sometimes longer. And then I would feel weak long, long time after that. They wouldn't even let me go to the gym. Now when we had, we were on raw food diet and I had fever, it only lasted six hours. Because I was cooperating with the body. I stopped eating right away. I gave myself an enema. I stayed in bed. I uh, uh, took cold showers when I felt too, too hot or something. And within six hours, you know what happened? I felt better than before. The, the, the high fever only lasted when it, as long as it needed to last. Can you guess what's my favorite animal? <laughs> My favorite animal in the world is bacteria. <laughs> I'm dedicated to research and um, support and whatever it takes promotion of bacteria because we totally misguided and misunderstanding what is this all about. Bacteria's uh, job is to recycle on that planet, I think. Recycling. Bacteria can recycle something that none of us, none of you, none of me could recycle. It recycles dead living things back into the soil. Can any of you recycle dead mouth into the soil without bacteria? You can recycle plastic into plastic. I can recycle paper into paper. But nobody could recycle anything living, that, that living thing into the soil because that's bacteria's job. That's what it is. And it's very important because without bacteria, we uh, won't have any soil. And without soil, we cannot live. We cannot live on that planet. Do you agree with that? Yeah. So it's very important to have soil. Why do we need soil? Because we grow things. We grow our food. Our most important food grows from the soil. What, whoever created bacteria, the creator, was genius and brilliant because bacteria is small and large, or we could say smallest and largest at the same time. Isn't it amazing? Bacteria is smaller than any, any living cell and it will get inside your body without causing any disturbance. And it doesn't even need a couple to multiply. And bacteria could multiply to any size instantly. Isn't it great? Doesn't matter if there will be 10 chickens or 1,000 of elephants, there will always be enough bacteria instantly. Or maybe the elephants will be waiting seven days per elephant and then those will be laying there untouched, not rotten, and waiting when there will be enough bacteria. Have you heard of anything like that? Mm -hmm. There will be always plenty of bacteria. And then when the protein will be over, there will not be bacteria wandering around. They will go back in the soil and wait there patiently. Great! Another interesting thing I discovered that bacteria can never destroy anything that is still alive. Bacteria is not interested in, in, in living things. Example, redwood trees. How long do they live? They live up to 3,000 years. Their roots are in the soil, covered with bacteria, unprotected, never rot, until the, the tree dies. 3,000 years! Some of those were planted before Jesus Christ was born. And bacteria doesn't dare to touch them. What does it tell us? That bacteria is not really interested in human flesh. How did it happen that we became so afraid of bacteria? I imagine that one day Louis Pasteur got for birthday a little telescope or something, microscope, and he was just playing with it thinking, what should I do with it? And then he figured out, I'm going to make some research. It was a long time ago. So he took some uh, healthy tissue and some sick tissue and he just looked in his microscope and wow, he noticed that in the sick tissue there are some kind of rods and some hooks, some kind of bugs moving. And he decided instantly, well, this is them who cause sickness. Well, how logic is that? Have you, have you ever seen the fire? Have you ever seen fire in your life? Yes. 
was the fire truck next to it? <laughs> have, have the fire truck been there? Always? I bet they caused the fire. <laughs> Wherever I go, folks, there is fire, the fire truck is right next to it. I guess, I bet, fire trucks cause the fire. <laughs> because they're always where the fire is. <laughs> when Louis Pasteur expressed that, certain people benefited monetarily right away from creating that kind of fear. And they started to plant this fear in everybody's heads. And if people even didn't believe in that, they thought, what if? I don't want to take a chance when talking about my baby. Ooh. And they started to take, take certain uh, precautions. On the deathbed, Louis Pasteur said, Hey, somebody, come to me with a notebook and a pen. I have something important to dis disclose. And he said, I was wrong. I was mistaken. It's not bacteria that causes disease. It is the disease that attracts bacteria. And you know what? That's been protocoled and that's been published. But the fear already has been planted. And the fear is so hard to get out of the brain. Because when it's fear, it paralyzes us. It, di it directs us into different direction. And we cannot really just trust. We cannot just say, hey. And where did it go? It went now so far away. Today we're totally confused. Today we don't see the real enemy. But we're still afraid of bacteria. So let me uh, be brave and bring some light to that matter. Today we're confused. Bacteria and chemicals. We're not afraid of chemicals. We're paranoid afraid of bacteria. I am afraid of chemicals. And I have one another question for you. Do you think bacteria, when it's rotting, smells bad? Do you think it smells bad? Yeah. Well, honestly, what do you think? Yeah. Smells bad? Please answer. Yes. Have you been to the forest? Yes. Does it smell bad in the forest? No. Does anybody rake leaves in the forest every fall? No. Are there any bathrooms in the, fo in the forest? No. Are there any cemeteries in the forest? No. So all these millions of animals die right there and birds and snakes and insects and all of those moles and mooses and everybody die there and nobody rakes leaves and nobody goes to the bathroom, everybody just doing it and mooses and everyone just right there <laughs> and it still smells good. Because the rotenin actually doesn't smell very bad. It actually smells like sour, okay? Or just, you know, it's like sweet. Where does it smell bad? It smells bad in the civilization. Why does it smell bad? I started to brainstorm and I started to make research and I figured out in 1800, humans took crude oil and they divided it into about 80 chemicals. Until then, everything that existed on this planet was created by creator, by universe, by whatever you believe it, by nature. It was all natural. And there was, it was all biodegradable. Do you agree with that? Yes. And then we took crude oil and we divided it into about 80 different chemicals. Today, just from crude oil, we make 83,000 chemicals. 83,000 different names that are not biodegradable, that cannot be recycled by bacteria, that cannot be anyhow go back into soil and become part of the earth, that we use, that we absolutely need in our life. And poor bacteria, when it begins, when it's so dedicated and when it tries to recycle this unrecyclable stuff like styrofoam, glass, plastic, metal, you name it, it mutates. It mutates. The precious, stress, normal, good bacteria mutates and it turns into a totally different one, which is very pathogenic bacteria. So who creates pathogenic bacteria? By millions, by zillions us when we enjoy this civilization. Now I want to ask you, how many chemicals do you have under your sink in your house? Just one? <laughs> Maybe just two? Many. 
Where does the chemi where do all these chemicals go after we use them? Where do they all go? Do you don't we know that everything is connected on, the, on this planet? Recently, they took um, the blood test from a newborn polar bear near the polar circle, and they found 62 chemicals into newborn pe blood of uh, polar bear. Where did they come from? Nobody went and sprayed there. How many our newborn babies have when we live right here? Now, the soap. Uh, that's a big issue, the soap. They say you have to wash your hands with the soap. So what is soap, what it does? Can you imagine how brave I have to be in order to discuss that in front of people? Well, first let me tell you, I didn't wash my body with soap for six years now. Never, even once, for six years. Okay, and I don't smell. <laughs> well, rarely I, ch I wash my hands with a soap. And I'll tell you why. I did research, and God bless the internet. I went into the internet and I found an article dated 1812 in Russian magazine. It said, Eureka, French people created rose water. In 1812, create ro rose water. That was the first um, a predecessor of soap. It was just the water, a few drops of rose in it. That's the first soap. What, what was the reason? The reason was not to uh, antibacterial. The reason was to smell good. <laughs> and then they started to develop, develop, develop. But some people figure out when you plant fear in somebody's head, they will buy much more. They will buy it for every family. I um, read, I went ahead and I read how the Tsar family were washing their linens. They would take their linens to the Moskva River and they would choose the nice looking girls and they will make them beat this linens or put lots of clay on linens and sheets and they'll beat them with round sticks and sing. They had to sing a love song loudly and then maybe they do it for an hour then they wash it in the river and then hang out to wind dry and that's the czar will sleep on that. No bleach, <laughs> no chemicals. So if you ever sleep on things like that, you sleep like a czar. <clears throat> there are several very wonderful books right now published about natural bacteria that we all have, as all living things have. If you don't use soap, then you have very good bacteria covering your entire body. That's protective bacteria, like acidophilus, bifidum, like good bacteria, very healthy. It's healthy to have this bacteria because this bacteria is there on guard and it will not let any pathogenic bacteria get inside your body. You don't want pathogenic bacteria to get inside. But the best protection is your own good bacteria that covers your body. The soap instantly destroys it opens the gates and you cannot you cannot stop it because you never know now we're so afraid of uh, bathrooms and I've seen women doing that they go around and just just doing that now can you tell me what's the difference be between bathroom door and the handle on the cart in the store and the door uh, any handle of any door in the church in the store in your house in 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 hotel in the restaurant is there any difference i would think the only difference is the door in the bathroom has more chemicals on it <laughs> um, how do I wash my hands? I just wash them for a long time in lots of water. I read how people washed their hands before they had soap, before they invented soap. They were washing it with dirt, with clay, with sand. In India, they wash it with ash. And in different countries, clay, clay. And I tried to even wash my, my hair and my body with the dirt when I was in the wilderness. You know, my family we lived for six months in the wilderness. And it was the best, but it will clog the sink, so I cannot do it at home. <laughs> so whenever I wash my hands, I make sure I wash it long time. If I want to conserve water, I'll put it in the bowl. And I, like in old times, I wash it long time in the bowl. And I feel that my hands are very clean. And I love my hands. They're so soft. And just, I can feel a lot with my hands. Okay, now you'll say, Victoria, we're afraid of disease. <sighs> I believe that when you stay raw, 
the bacteria and parasites will leave your body as they did leave my body and my children's body and my husband's body because we checked we did tests on parasites actually I'm going to publish pub publish the test our test that we don't have no parasites we don't have no sign of parasites and before when we went on raw when we were eating cooked food we did Hilda Clark 10 day cleans we went to Hannah Kruger and we bought all these things and we did 10 day parasite cleans and including our dog and cat and we still have parasites after 10 days we still have parasites and now after so many years eating raw food we don't have parasites not only parasites the mosquitoes don't bite us we went to Minnesota where mosquito is a state bird <laughs> they have so many mosquitoes all kinds of mosquitoes and we spent so many days in boundary waters and none of us had even single bite and then I talked to hunters. I tried to get any information I can because it makes total sense for me. But it's so hard to explain to others. So I went and I spoke to hunters. I said, tell me about parasites and animals. And they all told me the same thing. They say, if we go six hours deep in the forest and we kill elk, deer, any animal there, we open it up, there's no parasites in, the, in that animal. If we go one hour in the forest, the deer who still eats from our lawns that we spray, the deer that eats from our dumpsters, they have parasites in the brain, parasites in the heart, parasites in the liver, parasites in the intestines. <laughs> now, I don't believe that parasites are eating our body. They just, why, what are they doing there? They're scavengers. They're not eating your liver. They just stay in your liver because that's where we have toxins. They sit in there eating toxins. Well, they have their own waste, of course, but um, when you don't have any leftovers, they, they will just leave with the, excuse my language, with the first train, they'll leave out. Okay? <laughs> Take the mushroom parasite. It only could grow on the stump or on a dying tree, on an old tree. You cannot imagine, beautiful, you just plant a new tree in your garden or in your backyard and it will have mushroom? No. The parasites could only live on something that already half decayed. And mistletoe, they only grow along the highway, on the trees that are so weakened by highway, or in the dump area where the trees are half suffocated. The healthy trees, when they thinned and they really have enough sunshine, they could never have any of that. So, interesting. I went ahead and I asked some other people who eat raw food, do they have any, anything special about soap? And I found out that many of our raw food teachers don't use soap or shampoo anymore. I don't use any shampoo already for six years. Well, a woman in British Columbia, she taught me how to make raw shampoo. <laughs> it's um, flaxseed and water. You take half and half flaxseed and water, you soak it overnight, and then in the morning blend it in the blender, and that's your shampoo. It even makes little bubbles. <laughs> it cleans the hair really, really fine. And it's the best shaving cream. Of course, it spoils in three days. Um, and and uh, well, you just have to take uh, to make another one, but it, it only takes 30 seconds to make, okay? Uh, well, people trying to use soap to kill bacteria every day, well, do you want me to tell you the most ir ironic thing? That many of the soaps don't have anything in them that actually kills bacteria. <laughs> if you read uh, uh, the ingredients of the soap, very often, and I'm really thankful for that, there are some soaps have just three ingredients. Uh, vegetable glycerin that doesn't kill bacteria, uh, bee wax doesn't kill bacteria, and ar aromatic part, something aromatic, some essential oils don't kill bacteria. So, but they make lots of bubbles. <laughs> well, I think that's something that saves our skin and uh, ability to protect. Does it make sense? When you come in into the restaurant with your children and the waitress in front of you is spraying Windex, on the table, so you and then let it air dry. Do you appreciate that? <laughs> that she's hoping to, to get more tips from you. She's so making it clean. Clean in our understanding today means lots of chemicals. I don't like it. 
uh, once I had a chance to watch how they wash popcorns in um, in the movie theater, and in that movie theater they didn't even take popcorn leftovers from it. They just moved it with a piece of plastic to one side, sprayed it with toilet cleaner, and then wiped it with lots of paper towels to make it sparkling clean. Then moved it back and did the same with the second half. That's modern civilized society. No bacteria. Every bottle of Lysol says there instantly kills 99.9% .9 bacteria. Is this the enemy? We need to really rethink that. The enemy is chemicals. Chemicals will destroy us. For sure it will destroy our children and our unborn children. But bacteria will stay. We will die, but bacteria will survive. God created it so powerful and so able to mutate that it will continue. And so I really like bacteria. I think bacteria is not its fault. It's we created this artificial fever, fear. Does it make sense? Yes. Well, I, kn I know that it's theoretical and I don't expect you to overnight stop using soap. First you maybe need to go on raw food and kind of get your intestines cleaner, your inside cleaner, and then maybe you will feel more safe. But you could do some steps. At least you could begin to use more biodegradable soaps in your household. Okay, And baking soda and uh, hydrogen peroxide for washing some of your vegetables or just um, not many, not too many chemicals. Okay, thank you. When we went on raw food, uh, our ch my children, they were the first one who um, applied intuition to figure out what to eat. I was just going kind of from my head, actually directly from my head, and then Sergey was the first one who would go around bravely and grab different fruits that I didn't even know, know names of and he would bring them home and some of them later will figure out that you have to cook to eat because they've come from some different country and nobody knows what their name is. But then some of them tasted pretty good and pretty soon he find, found out that he loves mangoes. Those are expensive. And he would make me buy them to him every day. And then I started to buy them by a case. But I saw that he would eat the whole thing with the skin. And then he would lick the, the bone from the pit. And then he figured out he loves blueberries. So he was always, would always ask for mangoes and blueberries. He became mango boy. <laughs> and then Valya, she didn't care for mangoes. She didn't care for blueberries. She fell in love with figs all kinds of figs, also very expensive figs and olives. This eight-year-old girl would have on a windowsill gallon jars of um, uh, cured olives. She would she was cure them with lye, with uh, sea salt, with baking soda. She constantly dehydrate them and soak them again. And she was able to eat olives right from under the tree uh, without even being cured. And she said, oh, they're so good, they're not bitter at all. We were so lucky as a family because after three months on being raw, we um, met Dr. Bernard Jensen. He invited my husband to give him massages and so we could communicate with him just as much as we wanted. And Bernard Jackson, Jensen, he already died at the age of 94. He was a genius nutritionist, very noble man. I just loved that man so much. And I asked him, first time we met, I said, Dr. Jensen, can you tell me what should I feed my son, Sergey, who was diagnosed with juvenile diabetes? And Dr. Jensen looked in his books and he pretty quickly he said, well, for sure you have to give him more mangoes because mangoes restore the pancreas. And also feed him as much blueberries as you can because blueberries naturally reduce blood sugar. I said, Dr. Jensen, I'm amazed. That's what he's always asking for. <laughs> he said, well, that's normal. He's just following his natural craving. And then I said, Dr. Jensen, what should I feed my daughter who was diagnosed with asthma and allergies? He said, oh, if she has asthma, give her more figs. Figs restore their respiratory system. They nurture respiratory system and also feed her lots of olives because they help to liquefy and take out the mucus. I said, Dr. Jensen, that's what she's always asking for. And he said, well, she's following her natural cravings. And then he, Dr. Jensen looked at me and he said, my dear, tell me what do you crave? I said, Dr. Jensen, I don't eat what I crave. I eat what I, what's on sale. <laughs> so 
I usually eat bananas. <laughs> and Dr. Jensen was the first one in my life who told me this is so wrong. You cannot do that. Your body is your temple. Imagine you build in a beautiful temple or even just a house. And your contractor is coming to you and he says, Victoria, I need uh, 42 by 4s and they have to be 12 feet long. Can you tell him, hey, the windows are on sale? <laughs> oh, how about copper conduits instead? He will not build a house. He'll build a crooked house for you. So I started to keep this in mind. And when I went back to the store, I was standing there and I thought, what do I want? And my body proudly answered, coffee and donuts. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> and then it took me years before I really figured out what to eat. It took me years because I was not properly educated when I was a child. Now I know that whatever is addic addictive, which is cooked food, is all addictive. And we'll talk about this in our second part of the day today. But cooked food, I know, is addictive. And uh, whatever is addictive wants to come back. It pushes out everything else. Uh, if we have two dollars and we could buy a uh, donut and we, or just a croissant or we could buy mango, we would always choose croissant because it will satisfy addiction. Mango will not satisfy addiction. You cannot be addicted to mangoes or cucumbers or bananas. So the first rule is to keep addiction out of the picture. If you stay 100% raw, then addiction is out of the picture. And in magic time, two months, I usually it's 60 days when uh, we stop feeling craving for addiction for addictive substance we begin to crave from the frame of raw food we suddenly begin to crave things that are legal to eat on raw food diet and I've seen people who begin to crave very interesting things weird things sometimes like dandelions and cilantro and um, some kind of roots however very often people don't know what they crave and most often, people don't know what they crave. They just are suffering from this craving, and they don't have no idea what they want. Did it ever happen to you that you crave something? Our brain is complicated. It has analytic part, analytical part, and it also has a reactive part, reactive brain, which it's like on a level of um, impulses, a level of uh, instincts, right? reflexes. So this reactive brain remembers that, memorized that the food comes from the fridge. And when you crave something then, and you cannot figure out what you want, so this reactive brain sends you the urge to go and check in the fridge. Well, that's where food comes from. And then we begin to fall, like, just like dogs, you know, when you keep feed them from the same shelf, they keep barking on that shelf. So we keep going to the fridge and open, and we're searching and searching for something there. We don't know what. If you stop and say, hey, what do you search for? You don't know. As if you don't know what is there, as if you, you, you were not the one who put it there. Our children do the same thing. And we tell them, hey, stop defrosting the, the fridge. Go play. You just ate. You're not hungry. But they keep going and just looking for something. Have you noticed that? We have not been properly educated, um, uh, introduced to the foods. If we were educated properly, then our parents will begin to introduce the best foods to us, the whole variety, just when our uh, teeth are well developed which is age of three and four. They will begin to introduce to us 12 or more kinds of seeds, including pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds, sesame seeds, poppy seeds, different seeds, uh, quinoa and stuff. And 18 different kinds of nuts, not only almonds and walnuts, but hazelnuts, Brazil nuts, and macadamia, all kinds of nuts. 200 or more different vegetables and 300 or more different fruits. Unfortunately, we introduced to our children 200 different candy, 25 kind of kinds of cereal, and 15 kinds of bubble gum, and three kinds of pizza or more, it's just, but not the right things. So how do we introduce those things to our children? We take, for example, little Elaine was three years old, and mother comes to her and says, Elaine, give me your little palm. Yeah, and I put on her palm five pumpkin seeds and they're raw and I say, hey baby, eat them, chew them thoroughly and they're not roasted and salted, they're raw and I prefer that Elaine stays 
hungry at that time. She was hungry. And then she will chew those, uh, those pumpkin seeds. And what will happen? Her brain will get them, will process the information. Hey, we got very high quality zinc from that source. And in her memory, in her uh, basics, basic memory, there will be this connection. Pumpkin seeds, zinc. And then she will never have bristle nails in her whole life. Whenever she needs zinc, she'll look at her green wallpaper and it look like pumpkins to her. She'll go to the store and from the corner of her eye she'll see that something is flashing at her. Oh, what is that in the corner? Oh, pumpkin seeds. Oh, I would love some pumpkin seeds. That will be completely intuitive. And she, they will say, well, it's not on sale. Maybe you wait a month. She says, no, I want it now, no matter what it costs. And then you would always know exactly what you need to eat. That's how animals introduce the food to the cubs, to the little ones in the wilderness. At the proper time, when they're hungry, they introduce different variety. When you have all this rainbow of different elements, available and memory of it in your head, then you can survive anywhere in the world. You can go to one country, to another, Africa, India, you can go north, you can go to Iceland, you'll find what to eat everywhere. Uh, we started to do this later, like my children, they did it when they were eight and nine, and I started to do it when I was already in my 40s, and it took me years, maybe two, three years, before I was able to tell exactly what I need to eat. Today, I know exactly what I need. Like yesterday, I craved two kinds of sprouts, sunflower sprouts and buckwheat sprouts. And uh, I, was so, I was so lucky when I came to Super Sprouts yesterday because I just uh, put away all the shame and I just told to, them, to the owner, I say, I would like some sprouts because I've just been craving them for two days. And they gave me sprouts and on the way back home I was munching them and they were delicious. And I always know exactly what I want. When I want strawberries, I will go and I get myself strawberries. And another thing I noticed, if I eat what I crave, I eat a lot less. If I crave raspberries, I'll eat this box of raspberries and that will satisfy me for a day. If I eat what I'm not craving, I'll eat and eat and eat and eat and still I'll feel hungry, not satisfied. And the same with my husband. And I notice that we all crave different things. For example, Sergei, he loves bean sprout mix. He would eat it like every other day almost around the year. It's something he needs there, he can use there. Um, he could just eat it plain, he doesn't put anything on it, he just puts them and then he says, mm, oh, why is that so good? I don't like bean sprouts, you can pay me money and say eat and I won't eat them. <laughs> Valia, she doesn't love the bean sprouts much, you look at him like kind of, it's, he, he makes it look so tasty but she'll try them, she says, mm, no. She eats something else. She likes bitter stuff. Like I, I like bitter stuff. She likes endive and escarol and freezy. When you will introduce yourself to 100 different vegetables, you'll know what I'm talking about. <laughs> or um, radicchio is not bitter. And that serves us. I will tell you one story. When two winters ago, Sergei broke his clavicle. Of course, I was teaching 300, 600 miles away in Seattle. And he landed uh, on his clavicle on the, on the marble sharp um, a, a rock covered with puffy snow, crack, and he just was, and he was, his shoulder suddenly became here. And he said the first thing he, he wanted, he said suddenly my lips became so dry and I wanted with grass juice. Well, he never particularly liked that drink. He knew that it's good for him and he tried it and he was even growing with grass, but he never would just go for it. <laughs> and this moment he dreamed about wheatgrass juice. He said, I suddenly felt like I could just <gasps> drink like a big coffee mug of it. And the first thing he did when he was taken home, he sent Valya to the store. He said, take all our paddy cash and go to the local health store and buy, like, here's a quarter jar, just as much as you could buy for that. And take, and then he said, take all the pulp also. And when she brought it home, do you know what he did? He was squishing it in his mouth and he said, oh, this is so sweet, this is so good. He drank it all and he put it on his... Uh, 
um, wand and uh, he just put all this pulp in there. The next thing he craved was sesame milk. Interesting that he didn't want anything else. He completely didn't want to eat. He just wanted to drink and then he wanted to drink sesame milk. Valya was complaining to me. She said, he's been exploiting me. He made me uh, to create to to make him a pitcher of uh, sesame milk every couple hours, and he was just drinking it like crazy. When I returned home in two days, I was horrified by the big ball he developed on his clavicle, <laughs> and I thought it's a tumor. And I took him to the doctor to emergency, and it was the same doctor who took him in two days ago. And the doctor said, "Oh wow, what a miraculous healing is going on." The medical doctor said that. I said, what do you mean, Helen? Look at this, like a, it's like an orange size. It's the size of an orange. He said, that's a natural cast that body creates. He says that usually it's the size of a tennis ball. It's a small ping, ball, ping pong ball. That's calcification. It, it happens temporarily, and after maybe two, three months, then it dissolves completely. There's, uh, that's how n nature heals this uh, cast, uh, broken bones. Because there are some parts of our body we couldn't put cast on, so clavicle is one of them. And he said, I see that he developed such a big one in two days. He says, it's unbelievable. And then uh, when he was just taken by emergency, uh, they told him, uh, by ambulance, they told him that he will have to wear braces for six months, that he will have to forget about snowboarding for this winter, he won't be able to take a shower for like four to six weeks, he won't be able to move his arms for 12 weeks, and they told him he'll have to take painkillers. He didn't do any of that. In four weeks, he was swinging on a rope in Hawaii when we were doing our next class. <laughs> in four weeks. So uh, this, uh, this cast, uh, it was uh, because he was craving calcium. Sesame milk has lots of calcium. The doctor also says that usually when people have broken bones, they lose teeth because the calcium is drawn from different bones to the sick part of the body where the healing is going on. And because he was um, craving wheatgrass juice and sesame milk for several days, he had plenty of calcium and none of his bones uh, suffered from uh, leaking, leaking calcium. So isn't it wonderful? Wouldn't we all want to have that kind of health insurance? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I want to remind you and emphasize that our body never makes mistakes. We've been um, programmed to believe that we have to manage our body, we have to order what to do, we have to take charge of the body. I don't believe so. I think body is miraculous. It has a very high intellect and it has wisdom and it never makes mistakes. If you don't believe me, let's make an example. I quickly run, run around and poke everybody in everybody's left eye with my finger and we'll see which eyelid will blink, left or right. <laughs> And we'll see if uh, it, it could be possible. Can you imagine that I'll poke in the right eye and the left eye will blink? Can that be possible? Like, yeah. No. The correct eyelid will blink without you even thinking about this. How does the body know? Can you answer that question? How does the body know? It knows everything it needs to know. We think that we have to do something to the body. We should respect it. It's, it, it lived on this planet for so many millions of years. It knows everything the best. The only thing we could do is we could cooperate or we could go against it. Which one would you like? Which one would you choose? Do you want to cooperate with your body? So do it. Cooperate with your body. And when you feel tired, rest. When you feel sleepy, sleep. When you feel thirsty, drink. When you feel full, stop eating. When your body feels like walking and stretching, walk. When your feet are in pain from high heels, throw those high heels away, recycle them. <laughs> and so on and so forth. Cooperate with your body. And try to figure out what your body likes, what it doesn't like. Does your body like makeup on your face? Does your body like the eyeglasses? 
Does your body like everything you do? Thomas Quackenbush, he made an experiment in Florida. He took 100 volunteers and uh, he put, he said 50 people took dark glasses on, 50 didn't, and he placed them on the shore, uh, on the beach, and he, he was measuring uh, what kind of a sunburn they will have. Those people who were wearing dark glasses had much more sunburn than those who didn't. And then he started to make research and he found out that 99% of all the receptors that um, uh, received the information about the, um, the density of the sun located around eyes. So when we cover those receptors, we send an incorrect message to our brain saying, hey, there's a twilight, relax. <laughs> and, the, and when we don't, then these receptors become active and then they send the impulse to our hormonal system and say, hey, we need to, some, to do some protection from sunburn. Yet we all think we're so smart by putting dark glasses on. Then when we keep all those dark glasses on, we begin to lack vitamin D. Tom Quackenbush in his book, Relearning to See, he states that uh, we absorb most of vitamin D by this part of our body. And if it's always covered with glasses, either clear glasses or dark glasses, because clear glasses also have UV protection in them, we begin to develop lack of vitamin D. What is the sign of lack of vitamin D? Is irritability by the sunshine. When you have to squint, that means you already lack vitamin D, roughly. And then when you squint, then you want to wear more dark glasses, and then you're trapped in a vicious circle. I remember how I was always irritated by, uh, by bright light or sun, snow or sunshine, and then I would always have lines here. And then now when I learned this from Tom Quackenbush, I threw away all the dark glasses we had in my family and I stopped wearing them no matter where I go. Whether I go to the equator or whether I go to the snow country, I don't wear dark glasses. And I don't have any more lines because I'm not irritated anymore by the sun. Now he also teaches about uh, yawning, how important it is to yawn. He says when we yawning, what happens is the bulb of the air uh, goes up and it pushes on the pituitary gland and it squeezes some hormone with tears in our eyes that protects our vision. When we suppress the yanin, we uh, make our vision poorer. <laughs> Everything that body does, it does so perfect. We think we're so smart and we constantly interfere with the body. We doesn't let it be healthy. We don't let our body to have good vision, good hearing. The hearing when we live in big city, the body adjusts to the noise and it becomes about 30% deaf from cars because cars are very noisy, but we don't notice how noisy they are because we have about 30% deafness when we live in a big city. If you ever spend two months in the woods and you will gain 100% hearing and then you will come to the, to the car. When we lived for two months on the trail and then we, we needed to go to the post office to pick up one of our um, mail drops that we sent to ourselves on the trail with the supplies, we asked a man to give us a ride and when he turned on the truck, all four of us started to run away from the truck with the, with the yelling. And the man thought this is a bomb or something and he started to run away. <laughs> and then he said, what's wrong? And we said, your car is so loud. We've never heard such a loud car. And then later we were just laughing because we just, our hearing restored and this car was scary. It was so stressful. And then we also were um, now in two months of not driving, uh, the speed um, seemed much faster than it was. And he was driving barely 15, 20 miles and we just said, slower, slower, don't go that far. We were all having almost heart attack from him speeding. Because in the forest, in two months, we completely became normal. <laughs> so we uh, constantly live in this world and our body adjusted to all of this radiation, pollution, uh, electromagnetic waves and uh, stress and, ye and yelling and you name it. Glasses, makeup, ha chemicals, um, so many things. So. Uh, um, and we have to pay for every adjustment. We have to pay with our lifespan and health. Well, and the biggest of all is eating cooked food. 
So what my main, my main message to you is that our body never makes mistakes, remember that. And if uh, it doesn't behave how you would like it to behave, it means that you don't understand what's going on. But it doesn't mean that the body is stupid and it's just defective or it's just genes bad or something. If you were born without that problem, then probably you can recover. At least, whatever, 80% you can recover. Okay. Um, and now I would like to talk about sleep. Because we could go to such a great extent and we could um, change our whole lifestyle dramatically and become raw and still wouldn't feel good. So I want to uh, talk to you how by just improving your sleeping conditions, you can dramatically improve your health. Whoever created us, creator, was very, very, very genius. He predicted that we would try to abuse our body as much as we can. So he predicted that we would take drugs and alcohol and smoke and create stress and just plainly dis dis abuse our body. So he created a magical um, curse, which is sleep. He said, whatever you're doing, for forever you will be cursed to sleep, to lay unconscious without being able to move for eight hours every day for the rest of your life. You cannot smoke when you sleep, you cannot overeat when you sleep, you cannot drink when you sleep, you cannot take drugs, you cannot watch TV, you cannot do anything. You have to sleep every day. And why did he do that? Because he cared for us. He said, no matter what you do in the daytime, when you sleep, you will heal. I will enable your body to heal you, to heal itself like the best surgeon in the world. And so when we sleep in, we're healing. And if you sleep in properly, then you could almost completely recover from whatever you do in the daytime. But do we sleep properly? I find out, I found that we don't. Well, number one, our body is vibrating with a certain frequency, which is about 12 megahertz per minute, or 12 megahertz per second, which is uh, it's a very, very slow, it's, it's love. It's from David Icke. I read it from David Icke. The same frequency, trees, um, the nature, animals, 12 megahertz. That's why when we uh, hug the trees, we slowly begin to vibrate with the same frequency and we come down. When we're in stress, it's 40. When we stressed, and usually when we act at work or in traffic, it's 40. When we watch TV instantly, 40, 40. <laughs> then you feel unsafe, and you want to protect yourself. You feel like scared anybody could do anything, harm to me. But when it's 12, you feel one with everybody. You relax. You don't expect anybody to jump and do something to you. When you sleep, it of course has to be 12 in order for you to heal. Do you understand that? That's, that's when body could reach homeostasis. This natural balance when everything becomes healing and normal. And here is, we put this alarm clock next to our head, which is vibrating with 250 megahertz. And do we realize we have to remember that our body has, um, is not over right here. It has this energy. And the whole field is vibrating with 12 megahertz. And if we have this alarm clock right next, electrical alarm clock right next to the head, which is vibrating like very, very fast, does it let your body heal? No, it destroys the whole healing. How many of you have a large block next to your head? <laughs> honestly, honestly, thank you, bravely, wonderful. And some people don't have time, they're so busy, they don't have time to turn off the computer in the bedroom. How many of you have that? Computer in your bedroom, and the music station, that TV that has a huge, it has minimum six meters. And if it's on, if it, it, well, if you plug it off, that's fine. But if it's on, we just, you know, you just were watching and you fall, fell asleep and it's still, it's, it's quiet, but it's making you vibrate differently. 
And uh, there could be the, the wall here. There could be a wall, and here's kitchen, and maybe neighbor's kitchen, and there is microwave in the kitchen, which is another six meters. And you don't know, but it's really, it's like 650 megahertz. It's, it's, it's very high. So you need to come home and research in your bedroom and what's on the other side of the wall, what's going on, that you really don't have any electrical uh, features work, uh, working when you're sleeping. That's number one. That's easy to do. Okay, number two, we need to have fresh air. When God created Earth, there were 55% of oxygen in the air, according to Elizabeth Baker. 55% of the air was oxygen. How much do we have today? 12 to 19. It's depending where you live, in the city, in the country. In the bedroom, it is 6. Do you know why? 6% of oxygen, oxygen in the bedroom? Because we're very, very busy and we don't have time to open the window. And for 8 hours or 9 hours or 10 hours, we breathe in the same air, in and out, in and out. And finally, do you understand that when there is lack of oxygen in the body, then normal cells transform into cancer cells? And do you understand when there is abundance of oxygen, then cancer cells, they die and the body grows more normal cells. Oxygen is uh, directly connected to our well-being and not to having cancer. Even Rockefeller knew that, knew that in, in 1900. In, in 1800. So oxygen is very important. When I learned that about oxygen, when I read that book, uh, I just started, I, I said, Igor, what can we do about this? And he said, I'm thinking about also. I'm so lucky we're just the same people with him. So we decided to build some structure and he built something between gazebo and shed outside. And in Oregon we have six months of raining. It just has opening under the roof and a big window and a big door. And we, since then, we whole family, we sleep outside. And we don't have no electricity in that. And my sleep improved right away. It's wonderful. We try, whenever we travel, we try to sleep outside. <laughs> um, <clears throat> day before yesterday, we were sleeping at Lorena's house outside. And then it started to mist in the morning. We just, uh, we just pulled the tarp over our heads. <laughs> and we were just sleeping inside of this den. Igor and I. <laughs> okay, number three. Don't eat right before you go to bed because your digestive organs, they do two big jobs, digestion and evacuation. They cannot do those two in the same time. They do digestion first and then evacuation second. And both of them take several hours, especially if you eat something heavy like nuts or if you eat potato or meat or any cooked food, it takes much longer to digest. For example, you eat something at 10 o'clock in the evening that takes to digest four to six hours. Then at two or three in the morning, your body begins to evacuate. And then so your you know, you know, organs don't have a chance to rest. Maybe they didn't even finish evacuating this to the lower parts of the intestines by the time you wake up. Then you will, will wake up not rested because you didn't really rest. And your face will be swollen and you will have a heavy head. So try to eat something light before you go to bed and eat it enough time before so it digested before you go to bed like if you want to eat some fruits at six o'clock that's that's good and then they'll be digested by nine number four you need to sleep at night the grave shift graveyard shift is really deadly do you call it this in Canada grave yard shifts even if they pay 100 times more, they're still very deadly. Because um, all our organs, they work certain time of the day or certain time of the night, certain time. For example, I only remember that pancreas is the organ that pumps adrenaline for us to, uh, to function. The adrenals, they shut off at 11 p.m. and they stay closed until 1. That is why at 11 p.m. approximately, no matter what you do, you begin to feel so sleepy. Your eyes just close. Even if you're driving or reading, ooh, your body really telling you. Copyright with it. It's telling you, hey, now I need to sleep. 